Everyone told you that you can be good at writing, dancing, programming, math, and you felt that you have an obligation to excel at all these things at the same time. However, the biology limits you due to how your brain is built. How can you excel at an infinite amount of things with infinite proficiency when each of us was born with a limited amount of neurons that can never be replenished? Furthermore, the total number of connections that we have in our brain does not increase as we age. No, that number slowly decreases. So how can we acquire new skills and obtain new knowledge? I will explain a bit how the human brain functions and how to learn with purpose. For in order to learn something, something else must be forgotten. A lot of us are under the assumption that everything we learn stays learned, that our brain is sort of like a file cabinet of infinite size that you can just store information into to be used at a later date. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this is not the case. As I've mentioned, how can this be true if the total number of connections, once you start aging, decreases slowly? but still decreases. A thing that our brain loves to do is to predict. For every situation we find ourselves, it predicts an outcome. The best learning signal comes from unexpected, wrong predictions. When that happens, you have to incorporate those kinds of situations into your prediction machine. So, you may arrive at a point in your life where you're always right in your predictions. When that happens, your brain becomes more stable, almost rigid in that knowledge. And we want to avoid that. As we grow up, for each skill, our brain favors a more stable system so that it has less to change. So, as we acquire new skills and knowledge, the ability of the brain to change and to adapt reduces. However, a healthy, aged mind is one that is actively fighting this by constantly introducing new skills, new knowledge, or sometimes even better, by broadening our understanding of a certain skill so that we may have the future changes done more easily. This is what we call plasticity. In development, the brain is extremely plastic. When we grow up, we pass through these sorts of critical periods where we are first developing certain skills and certain senses. So, what is a critical period? It is a period in our lives where the brain is extremely sensitive to environmental stimuli so that you may gain this function. So, in order to have a function, we must first be exposed to it. And this must be done at an early age. As an example, I will showcase an experiment that was done in the previous century, which would not be possible today due to obvious ethical problems. Nobel Prize winners Hubel and Weasel stitched the right eye of monkeys immediately after birth, and they kept it closed for six months. During that time, the monkeys were growing up using only one eye and were otherwise unaffected. So, when they finally opened that eye, what happened? Even though the eye itself was functioning, the optic nerve was maintained and was later shown to work, the brain itself was irreversibly changed. Since the brain, during this critical period, learned only to accept information from one eye, when the other eye was opened, no matter the amount of training they did with these monkeys, they couldn't learn to see with both eyes. You see, in this critical period, the brain became stable with vision from only one eye, and no amount of training could ever change that. 
This is an example of a critical period in our senses. But what about cognitive and mental abilities? Victor here was found at the age of 13 in the 19th century. He was found by hunters near a small village. He couldn't speak, didn't understand language. He was making unintelligible sounds and was running on all fours. As enlightenment was in full swing, he was taken to Paris so that he could be educated and reintegrated into society. You see, when a child grows up without any social contact, they end up with a very impoverished language and a delayed development of all cognitive abilities. No matter the amount of time, resources, or patience that was poured into Victor's education, he couldn't learn to speak, understand language, or integrate into society. I must note that reality is not so black and white. Other examples of children raised in similar environments show that if you invest a lot of time and resources to help them, they will eventually learn those skills, social etiquette, they will integrate into society. The problem here is that it will take a large amount of time, whereas we as kids learn those things almost passively. So, being exposed to those functions at a very young age not only gives us these skills, but allows us faster learning in those areas later on in our lives. When we are kids, if we go through these criti critical periods, we are creating a framework for learning. As adults, this framework is a foundation upon which we can improve, adapt, or change. And we change it constantly. In the area of the brain that controls movement, we have a sort of map for for all of our muscles. This, we know this because we used functional MRI to see which parts of the brain are responsible for moving our hands, our faces, or our feet. So this map is also highly dynamic and highly adaptive. It is changed by our individual exper experience each day. How do we know that? Well, Scientists trained monkeys to use very precise movements of the thumb and index finger to extract treats from a very small well. The monkeys did these tasks relentlessly each day. After becoming very good at the task, the area of the monkey's brain in charge of the thumb and index finger expanded, stealing away the function of the surrounding area, which were the other three fingers. So, as they became better, something was lost to allow this change. Likewise, these same monkeys, if they didn't practice this task for a longer period of time, the area for the thumb and index finger shrunk, as other motoric skills were prioritized and other three fingers were used more. This holds true for us humans as well. For example, if you experience a very small stroke located in this area of the brain, you will lose all function of your fingers and your wrist. Due to the death of neurons that were in charge of moving these muscles. However, hope is not lost. With intense physiotherapy and rehabilitation, there is a chance that you will regain the function that you have lost. What we saw is that neurons that are directly above this area, the ones that in this picture move the forearm, changed their function and learned how to move the hand. So you see, with intense patience, with intense physiotherapy and with intense motivation, even though these neurons never in our lives move the hand, they learned how to do it. A neuron cannot lose its function. What gives them life is communication, and if they don't communicate, they die. However, since we don't really get a lot of new neurons in adulthood, 
Our brain doesn't allow that. So if a neuron loses its function, which could be from an injury or just a simple lack of interest, for example, I don't want to play the piano anymore, mom, it needs to find something else to do. And it needs to do it fast. So how do we learn? We need to show that we are serious about it. We need to think about it, we need to remember it, we need to relearn it, we need to repeat it under different circumstances and different emotional states. This is why a regular study routine will always be more effective than cramming. Otherwise, your memory will be that of a goldfish. Every time we remember a piece of information, we are sending a signal to our brain that this memory is important, that we mustn't delete it. And our brain deletes a lot. Almost everything that you remember from today's talk will be forgotten in a week. And we need to do that in order to free up space for things that we find important. So, it is not surprising that older memories, the ones that survived this great brain memory filter, are more firmly established than newer ones. This is highlighted in patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease. While the disease is still not in its final stage, their loss of memory is more drastic in recent events in a day-to-day -day basis, while the older memories they can recall almost unconsciously. This holds true for skills that involve a lot of practice, for example, driving a car, or playing an instrument, or singing. I believe that for every skill and for every new knowledge, our brain has to make a trade-off regarding what it knows. In order to learn something, you must forget something. This is offset by chipping away at everything little by little. So instead of losing large lumps of memories, you lose the least important ones, while the more important ones have their details reduced. This holds true for skills as well. As we obtain new skills, the ones that we do not use get prioritized less and, in time, forgotten. Some of you might say, well, if this is the case, wouldn't stability allow us to be better? If we only focus on the proficiencies that are, for example, needed for our work, wouldn't that lead to our success? I tend to disagree. A condition called highly superior autobiographical memory notes people that have an amazing capability of remembering every detail in their lives. They could state what they had for lunch for every day of their adulthood. You would expect these people to be among the most successful people on Earth, but they are not. It is as though the brain gets locked in a sort of motivational loop of only having a single important thing to do, and that is to remember everything. So, thinking that being proficient in one thing could lead to our success, it could lead us into a trap. You need to test your brain, challenge your brain with new skill and knowledge acquisition, not only because you're gaining those skills, but because by doing that, you are allowing your brain a more ready state to change. It can change more easily when the need arises. If you don't do this, your brain will be stuck in the same mode of operation, and you will have problems once the change that is needed doesn't come from yourself, but from the outside. Every time we learn a skill, when we repeat it, we are sending a signal to our brain that this skill is important, that it mustn't delete it. And in doing so, we are stabilizing it and optimizing the resources that we have in our brain to do the skill more efficiently. For to be better than somebody else in a skill does not mean that we have a larger brain or more neurons or more connections. No, it means that for the same task, we use less resources, freeing up space for additional tasks. 
The devil's bargain here is that you have to actively repeat this skill in your day-to-day -day life, otherwise you tell your brain that it is also replaceable, and trust me, very quickly, it will be replaced. So, to answer my question, how can we excel at an infinite amount of things with infinite proficiency when each of us was born with a limited amount of neurons that can never be replenished? Obviously, it is impossible. The truth is, everything you do, you're getting better at it, at the expense of everything else you know. Thank you.